This is Boxing Tickets NA in association with Violent Gentlemen. Um, we're proud to say we are joined by the, the baby lion of Irish boxing and Caitlin Phelan. Hey, Glenn, how are you keeping? <laughs> All is fantastic. How's yourself? Yeah, good. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited for this one. Definitely. Um, obviously, it's sort of said the off air, obviously, just in case you thought it was in a riot zone. I'm very, very close to obviously the riots in Belfast. So, anybody obviously hearing sirens and stuff in the background, you're not up to any bad things. I'm not up to any bad things. It's just what's going on on the environment at the moment. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, obviously, yourself with lockdown, obviously, a lot of people, it's been very tough for lockdown. Um, you've actually had the, you've actually fought just before the lockdown and you fought twice in the lockdown. So, you're probably one of the most active boxers out there at the moment. Yeah, exactly. I'm very privileged to have at least three fights, uh, especially two in the lockdown. Not many people have. The thing is, I've stayed ready and I've stayed in the gym for an opportunity like this to come above. And as soon as we got the call, we were ready to jump on it. So. And, and where did it, did it... I guess, obviously, everybody keeps pointing back to Eddie Hearn, where Eddie Hearn was saying, if you want to fight, you have to stay ready. Is that where the sort of, where the sort of thing come from? Was Eddie Hearn giving out good instruction to everybody? Yeah, of course, like everyone heard of Eddie Hearn, but it's kind of, if you want to be a professional boxer, you need to do professional things to be a professional. So mm. it was... The day I signed my contract, that was the day I decided it's time to be professional and to do that, stay in the gym, stay ready. Like, I always go back to um, Stevie Collins. Like, he got a call to fight Eubank and, like, that was one call and his whole life changed with that one. So, it kind of, that was the inspiration through it, so. Yeah, fantastic. And obviously, it's something that's, that's kept you in good stead, you know, that if opportunities come, you have to be ready for them. Um, exactly. Yeah. So, so sort of rolling, rolling away back as I sort of do with, with a lot of boxers. What age? Did you st obviously, you're only 20 years of age now, so it, it's probably not a long time since you know spoke to people that've been boxing for 20 years and stuff like that. What age did you sort of start out boxing yourself, and why? Yeah, so I started boxing when I was around five or six years old. Um, I started in a gym in Newbridge called Ryston Boxing Club, mm -hmm. and the reason I wanted to do it was because my dad was a coach and my two brothers boxed. And I was a little girl of the family. They're like, oh, you're not allowed to do it. You're a little girl. It's not for you. Whereas I'm very stubborn. If someone tells me not to do something, it gives me more reason to do it. Yeah. So I just, I wanted to do it. And I used to go over and watch my brothers train. And I used to just join in every now and again. My dad was like, Kitten, you're not doing it. You're not boxing. So at the time, there was a guy called Tom McDermott that owned the gym. And I was like, Tom, can I train? Can I become a boxer? He goes, yeah, Kitten, go on, jump in. Like, keep in mind, I was a small little five or six year old with a group of 13, 14 year old boys. And I was having the time of my life. I wanted to bait them up. All I wanted to do was train. And that's kind of when my passion started to grow for the boxing was I was allowed to do it. And I wanted to be just like my brothers. Yep. And obviously, you know, you were talking back 15 years ago now, obviously mm -hmm. Katie, Katie Taylor also been coming through the amateur ranks. Was she sort of somebody you looked up to then as you were starting out boxing? Yeah. So when I actually started out first, like, I didn't know who Katie Taylor was, but then the older I got, the more everyone started to hear about this girl, Katie Taylor. And if it wasn't for Katie, there wouldn't be female boxing, to be honest. Mm. Like, no one would have kept going. There wouldn't mean that motivation for all other females to join and stuff like that. So, of course, the older I got, like, once I started hitting 10, 11, that's kind of when she went around the Olympics and stuff like that. Mm. And that's when you were like, damn, female boxing will actually take off. Like, we can do this. And, of course, thanks to Katie Taylor, it's, it's the reason why. Yep, fantastic. And obviously, um, Kate, Katie's obviously still going from strength to strength in boxing now. You know, was she 34 now, I think? And um, she just seems to be getting better and better with every fight. Yeah, no, she is. She's a really big inspiration. And even just her work, work ethic is just, it's unbelievable. Have, have you sort of spent any time with Katie in the past? Or obviously, do you keep in contact sort of to get some tips and help from her? You know, a lot of people ask me this. And it's, I only met her like once or twice as an amateur. I haven't... Like we won't be in contact or anything like that. Not yet, anyways. But hopefully, in a couple of weeks or you know, a couple of months down the line, she might get in contact with me. So. Yep, and, and obviously, as a as a fan, sort of growing up as an amateur boxer, you're like, oh my god, there's Katie Taylor. Whereas she'll probably be now be going, oh my god, there's Caitlin Phelan. You know. <laughs> plan anyway, so. But but there's so much um, there's so much respect and friendship, obviously, within boxing. Sometimes you know, like obviously, other people and stuff we've interviewed when they've been sparring people, it's a lot better than them. To be giving them help along the way to sort of like keep your left hand up and things like that. Boxing's probably that one sport that brings everybody together. Yeah, like no matter who you are or what you are, like no matter your race, your sexuality, no matter like anything, as soon as you get into the ring, you're 
boxers you're both human beings and that's all that matters and that's the one thing about it like it doesn't matter where you come from your age your color anything everyone's equal and it's just it's respect as soon as you get into that ring and no matter what happens inside a fight you'll always shake hands or give a hug and say well done to your opponent so yeah but i say that sort of respect's lost in a lot of sports nowadays and boxing's the only one that seems to keep it going um exactly obviously looking at your your amateur career you you pretty much done most of all what you've what you can do in boxing for obviously anybody watching can you obviously tell them what you've achieved as an amateur boxer yeah so as an amateur i got 10 national titles i had a european bronze medal and a world bronze medal and i i loved amateur and i just i started to not have a passion for it anymore and that was the day i decided i needed to make a change because if your heart's not in it you're only going to get hurt so the change was to turn professional for me yeah, but and, and turning turning professional, you were eighteen. Uh, yeah, I was in the yeah, eighteen. In the gun, yeah. Eighteen. So you made you made your debut, and, and yes, you made your debut live on, on Irish TG Four. Um, obviously, talk us up. You know, dream come true. Obviously, to become a pro boxer. Then you know, it's they say when you make that decision that no longer amateur and, and putting on the gloves as a pro, was it sort of dream yeah. come true for you that all that hard work was getting you somewhere? Yeah, it really was like. For my debut, it wasn't. We didn't really have much notice for it. It was kind of. I got a phone call from um, Connor Slater, and he was like, "We have a slot on the show. I know you've been at me for months now. Do you want it?" And my brother Alan was on the show as well, so I was like, "Yeah, we're like make history that night." So I've always wanted to turn professional. Like, everyone has the dream as an amateur to go to the Olympics. I just didn't have that dream. Mm-hmm. I always knew there was something different for me. So I had the dream of turning professional, and my opportunity came. So I couldn't turn around and say, no, I don't want it. So I was like, yeah, I want it. I got everything ready. I weighed in. And because it was in the national stadium, it gave me that little bit of, I was more relaxed because I fought there numerous times before. Mm -hmm. And everything just felt good. And it felt like everything fell into place that night. And I knew that's where I belonged. And and the national national stadiums, obviously, you know, built with so much history and stuff as well. And, you know, yeah. probably when when you were boxing as an amateur, there was full crowds and stuff there as well. So knowing you were going there as a pro, you already you already pretty much come across it. Probably whenever you fought, there may not have been full capacity, say people at the bar and things like that. But but you knew what to expect going into it. Yeah, exactly. I knew the ring. Like I I used to have dreams about the ring, and you knew exactly the walkout and everything like that. And like the only difference was there were there was more people, there was lights and music, but you're doing the exact same job. You're getting inside a ring and you're punching. And no matter what, that is the same. So, Yeah, but listen. And, and obviously your, your second pro fight pretty much came, what, a few months later, on uh, the Neptune Arena in, in Cork. Um, and then obviously you fought in Belfast um, just before the pandemic last year in the Devonish. Um, what's, how did obviously signing with Box in Ireland come about? So I actually, I didn't, I wasn't signed to anyone when I made my debut. So I was literally, I was free. There was no one. And then I got in contact with Stephen Sharp and I was like, look, I'm looking to sign with someone. I am I want to have more fights as a pro. And I was like, can we just have a chat and get some information and things like that? So Stephen actually came down to my local gym in Kildare. And he, so we sat down, had a chat. They gave me a contract to look over and literally just happened that easily. I signed a contract with them and... Then I had my second fight with them. I also uh, started training with Niall Barrett in Unit 3 in Nace mm-hmm. uh, just before my second fight. So I had, I now had a management, I had a promoter, I had a new coach, and things were actually finally going to plan and how I wanted them. And I, just, I started to feel happy in myself. And, and, and with Stephen Sharp, I guess, he probably, he probably knows the right way to do things. Um, putting a contract in front of you, probably the impulse is going, I ah, just sign it. You know, don't even bother reading the small print, just sign it and let's yeah. get, it, get it going. Yeah, see, I, I was smart and I brought a contract home with me and I read it before signing anything. So, and the deal was that if I signed a contract with them, they'd get me fights and I'd get a box in Ireland hat as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. So, it was so all, it all didn't took me a year to finally get the hat off them, but I got it. <laughs> <laughs> you finally got the hat as well. I did, um, yeah. <laughs> Obviously, as I say, with lockdown, obviously, you had your third pro fight, you know, you fought three times within 11 months of making your debut. Um, yeah. You obviously had the, the first field fight with, and I've sort of asked you off air how do you say her name, and I'm probably going to say it wrong again, uh, Jessica Sadako. Um, did obviously, when that first fight f- fell through, did you feel you'd, you'd lost that opportunity? 
Uh, to be honest, me and my team had a feeling that that was going to happen. We have a, like we have a saying where the obstacle is the way. So we knew that no matter what was going wrong, something good will come out of it. So when the fight fell through, we're like, okay, that just gives us more time to train, more time to prepare. And we knew that it would happen again. So we just kept going, kept our head down, stayed in the gym, and the fight then came back up, and we were 100% ready for it. And, and was it was it, the master stroke of obviously taking down all the footage of your fights? Was that before the first fight fell through, or was it before the second fight? Uh, that was before the first fight fell through, yeah. My coach, Niall, said, it's a good idea. I'll never get to do it again. Not many fighters can take their footage down and get away with it. Like, you'll always find something. Whereas no one knew me. No one knew my name or where I was or anything like that. So we're like, this is a great opportunity. It's a good experiment. So we literally, everything, social media went on private. Uh, Facebook was private, Instagram, everything. YouTube, there was no videos, nothing. And no one could find anything about me. So they couldn't do their research. And But we knew everything about her. Like there was everything you could find about her. Like we were down to the stage, we knew her eye colour and everything. So <laughs> knew what she had for breakfast. What was her favourite? Exactly, perfume? yeah. <laughs> and, um, but but obviously, you know, when you look back, obviously now on it, it was a master stroke was obviously played and you know, I guess probably might set a trend for others to go, that's actually smart to do that because mm. so so many people nowadays are are quick to post up training footage and everything else, showing what they're working on yeah. when they're playing into the strengths of their opponent, whereas some people are smart in a way, like other boxers I know, won't put up stuff they're working on. They'll do mess yeah. about videos just so people can see something. Yeah, like you don't mind posting videos and stuff of if you're doing weights or something like that. But you have to be smart about it as well. You can't give everything away. It's like chess. You have to stay two steps ahead. You definitely do. And, and obviously then, you know, the fight was announced then that you're, you're going to be fighting 17th of October, probably a date you're never going to f- forget. Um, it, as fights go, it was as one-sided probably as, as you can imagine. You, you had obviously the, the mindset at the start that you were going to stop her regardless. You know, WBC Youth, WBF and IBA titles and actually fighting in her own gym as well. So yeah. if you needed any more pressure to go and do something or, or less pressure to go and do something, you had it all? Yeah, no, I had... Everything was planned down to a T. We knew exactly what was going to happen. Like, I had everything done. I was doing the hard work in the gym. I had my recovery perfect. I was doing uh, flotation tanks. I had a psychologist. I had everything down to a T, and I knew exactly what was going to happen in the fight, and so did my team. Like, me and Niall sat down before the fight, and we're like, what do you think will happen? And at the same time, both of us said exactly what was going to happen in the fight. And we predicted that we'd stop her. We didn't say that we'd knock her into that. We just predicted that she'd quit on her stool, and that's exactly what would happen. And I have the three lovely belts there to prove it. So. <laughs> yep, exactly. And I say, what a what a moment is you know, so young in your career, they obviously have belts around your waist. You know, in terms of obviously fighting fighting at home, it's, it's so difficult. They obviously get get fights for Irish titles. So, you know, them titles are probably not that they mean more to you in in other belts you've had, but. It was the first sort of stepping stone in, into the career of, of yourself because, you know, how, how are you going to get someone at your weight at Irish title level and things like that? Exactly. And when an opportunity like that comes up, you need to take it. Like, you'll have fighters turn around and say, oh, I don't have enough time. I need more time. And if you really are a professional fighter, you don't need time. You should be ready for it. And that's exactly what happened with us. Like, we there was a few more people that like, obviously got off the, offered before us. And... They were all like, oh, no, I don't have enough time. I can't make weight or anything like that. Whereas we walk around ready and we know we're ready for an opportunity like that to come about. So. Yeah, exactly. Grab it with both hands. Took the belts exactly. on. Um, I know that uh, their team sort of been looking for a rematch since, but whenever you quit and you're still in a, a one-sided one beatdown, you know, what's the point of redoing it again? Because it's probably only going to get worse the second time around. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Like, going over there, we had so much pressure. Everyone doubted me. They... They thought it was in their hands, like they had everything planned for her to win it. And no one expected anything from me. It's like, oh, we'll bring over this Irish girl with like not a good record at all, no amateur, not and like they didn't do any research on me. Whereas we knew everything and we were ready for it and <laughs> I'm ready any day they want the rematch, which I doubt they will. So <laughs> Yep, exactly. And, and I know I know that obviously you're, yourself you moved down and down and wait uh, um obviously you're out in Luxembourg last month and you moved down to one forty. Is obviously the plan the the stay at one forty now or are you just flexible to sort of any weight class, any fight comes? 
Yeah, so we'll probably stay at 140 for a few fights and see how it goes and then sit down and have a chat with my team again and see what the plan is then. Like, I don't mind fighting at 140 or even heavier or lighter. So I'm I'm doing the work and I can make the weight. So we'll just sit down in a couple of weeks' time or even a couple of months' time and see what opportunities will come at what weights. Yep, fantastic. And, I'll, and obviously linking up with Niall as well. We obviously want to thank Niall for obviously giving us some more research that we sort of didn't have in yourself. If, if, if somebody knows something about you, it's Niall. How obviously important <laughs> is, has Niall been in obviously helping to bring you across from the amateur side of things? You know, he's been there since fight two. But obviously, how, how important has it been bringing Niall into the team? It's massive. Like, Niall knows more about me than I know about myself at this stage. So, but the training has changed massively. I'm in an environment where it's a professional environment. I have a good coach. I have good teammates. And like I'm enjoying what I'm doing. Whereas you could walk into a gym and you could absolutely dread it every single day. And that's how you know you shouldn't be there. Whereas I wake up every morning looking forward to get to the gym. And Niall changes it up. Every day there's something different in the workouts. So you're not going in doing the exact same thing over and over again and getting bored of it. It's something different and you're working on what you need to work on. Like everything's planned out to a T and I'd be completely lost without Niall, the Unit 3 gang and my dad as well. And, and obviously not forgetting your, your teammate as well, Gary Colley. You know, what, what, a, what, a, what a unit you are sort of building there. Would, you, would, you, would it probably be fair to say that success Gary's having has probably spurred you on more? Yeah, of course. Like Gary motivates me every day when I'm in the gym and he's not the type of guy that will work by himself and whatnot got to do with you. He's the total opposite of that. If he's doing something and he sees you're struggling a little bit, he'll come up and he'll push you and motivate you to achieve as well because he knows damn well that you're well able to do it. And like we just finished training there about an hour ago and the workout, he was just ahead of me and I was like, I'm not going to let him beat me. And that's the thing, like you have that little bit of competition, but it's healthy competition. It's what you need. Like, and it's good to get to train alongside him and even some of the other guys that are with Pete Taylor as well. Like, it's great to get to meet them and to see other professionals in their career as well. Yeah, but, and obviously, you know, Gary himself is, you know, he's is a freak of nature, you know. They fight at lightweight at, at that height, you know. Um, yeah. I remember watching him very early on. I think he fought in the, the SSE, I think, like his second or third fight. And I remember actually talking to him afterwards and saying, Gary, do you realise you say boom and bang when you're throwing punches? And he's going, I didn't even realise. You know, so I think I put that thought process in his head where he's going, yeah. say boom or bang. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> Gary, know? he's he's one of a kind, definitely. <laughs> he definitely is. And, you know, like he's Irish title now, WBO European title. And, and I think when he pretty yeah. much finished the fight a couple of days, of he won it straight back in the gym and he's been banned for a week. I guess that probably shows the, the nature of what you're doing down there. You're just so addicted yeah. to the gym. Like, we were both, like, the week after his fight, he was not allowed in the gym. And the week after my fight, I wasn't allowed in the gym. Like, both of us were just eager to get back. And it just goes to show what such a good place that we're in, that we're eager to get back to it and get back doing what we love and what we're good at, so. Adrenaline junkies probably is a better word for it sometimes. <laughs> True, yeah. <laughs> um, obviously, there, there's, been, there's been, obviously, talks of, of obviously, offers from um, America. They obviously fight um, Sonny... I can't remember her uh, name. Summerlin. Summerlin. Um, I know her, yeah. her manager, obviously, Rick Ramoso, was sort of saying about putting, putting news on the, the Katie, Katie Taylor card. But I guess a good thing for you is obviously even Nile and, and Box Ireland and everybody else there, it's keeping you grounded. You know, at the end of the day, you're only 20 years of age. So, you know, what's the sense of rushing anything at the end of the day? What you're going to achieve in boxing is going to be in your timings rather than somebody trying to force you out for a fight. Yeah, like you have to be smart as a professional boxer as well. And to be honest, like, I'm aiming for bigger names than Summerlin. Like, I'd rather the bigger names than someone small from a gym in America. Like, I know I'm going to make it bigger than something like that. So, and I deserve bigger as well. So, I, I don't mind them calling me out and giving me the publicity that I deserve. So, <laughs> they can yep, keep doing exactly. that. Oh, anytime they want to call you out, as long as they tag you in the posts and they're a good following, you're not mind. Yeah, it. exactly. Once I get, like, a comment or something like that, keep me tagged and I'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> you might, you might, might obviously be be good for the the Dylan Moran obviously thing with the Jake Paul. I think his Instagram trebled, you know, just be Jake oh, yeah. Paul calling him out. I should just call out Jake Paul there now. So <laughs> <laughs> why not? You might as well. Um, obviously, the jump on the bandwagon. <laughs> the exposure, obviously, after um, after obviously your success in Germany, um, it's it's obviously fair to say that probably a lot more people's jumped on the bandwagon since and 
giving you a lot more exposure. Yeah, massively. Like my Instagram went up massively. My Twitter, like I never really used Twitter beforehand, but since uh, Germany, I have, and it went up massively. And I was, I was quite shocked by it. But I've after getting so much support, and I'd be completely lost without it. And especially my sponsors as well. Like the sponsors that came on board beforehand and afterwards, it's unbelievable, and I'd be completely lost without them. So. Yeah, exactly. And, and we obviously echo that sentiment of obviously sponsorship so important to, yeah. to boxing nowadays. Probably even more so we your fight last last month in Luxembourg. Um, I guess obviously people sometimes don't realise that sometimes you know it's not the case where you're getting paid to, to paid to fight and things like that. I think I think from one of your posts, I think you said that the, the trip cost like seven thousand eight hundred euro. Yeah, it was very expensive that I've had a lot of people text me and say, why would you pay that much money for like not even a title fight? The thing is, you need to make these sacrifices if you want a good career. And I know it, this is only temporary. Like I said, like I'm very grateful for my sponsors that jumped on and helped me with this fight. And it is a lot of money, but I'm after fighting a very good opponent and it got my name up more. And I got another, another fight on my record as well. So yeah, I just see it as a benefit. But like yeah. the trip to Luxembourg, anything that could go wrong went wrong. And it was a massive learning experience for me and my team. And no matter what happened, we literally just kept our head down and pushed through it. And I think it showed on the night as well. It, it probably shows how far probably your success um, of last year's probably helped and, and bring you on and probably mature you more as a fighter. Because yeah. I think you had a missed flight. Uh, Kapsina looking to pull out. Um, you know, the expense of the trip and everything else, you know, probably anything that could go wrong even before the fight happened was going wrong yeah like we had said uh, the day or the flight was changed to the day after um we my coach lost his bag <laughs> we had no we had no scales the opponent was complaining about weight she was complaining that she wanted to pull out and it was it was fun to be honest like i have to admit that i was in my bed for 90 percent of it asleep <laughs> so I can't really say that it was hard because it was mainly Niall, my dad, and the, my rest of my team that kind of dealt with everything. But it was it was a great experience. And it just goes to show that if you give up at the first obstacle, you're not going to get anywhere, that there is always a way around it. Fantastic. It's good to hear sort of a positive mindset and things. It's probably, you know, it's probably showing probably why, why you're growing even more because you're just honest and you're just, just so professional about everything you do and, and staying positive. Um, obviously fighting Karina Kubsika as well. Um, obviously a former Katie Taylor and Shannon Cameron opponent. Um, I don't think he lost a second of any round of that fight. You know, it was actually it was a really enjoyable fight, and it was my first full eight rounder. And I got out of the ring, and I, I just wanted to go again. I was soon as soon as I threw the first jab, I knew that I had this fight. And I, I I'm a bit terrible when I get into the ring. I smile at my opponent. I'm just always smiling because I just enjoy it so much. But I think I proved to everyone that I'm able for this level and I, I'm able for more. And I'm just excited for what's to come as well. And, and it's quite refreshing to see that you sort of moved down in weight and, and your energy levels, they burn. You know, you didn't, you, didn't put, you didn't take a backward step once in the fight and just kept going. Obviously, during the fight as well, we're obviously speaking to Leonard, um, obviously about judges and referees and everything else in, in Luxembourg. What did you sort of make of the re the referee stop on the fight? They they clean Karina's nose. <laughs> to be honest, I wasn't too sure about the referee. Like he gave out to me once or twice for certain shots I threw, and he's like, "No, no, not allowed, not allowed." I'm just like, "I'm a professional boxer. Like I'm allowed to throw a jab and a backhand. Like come on." Mm -hmm. And he stopped it just to clean her nose, and like her nose was pretty bad. And the first thing that came into my mind was, "Oh no, my gloves and my gear are going to have blood in them." <laughs> and the problem was, I got to the corner, and I was like, "I know damn well what you're thinking." I was like. Yeah, can you clean my gloves? <laughs> but yeah, he stopped it just to clean her nose, whereas I honestly thought that he was going to actually stop the full fight. But I'm glad it went on. It was sort of like a one-sided beatdown, but I guess the good thing for you is the fight went to full eight rounds. You now know yeah. that you've won eight rounds and you still have more to give. Um, yeah. what, would your, what would your sort of thoughts be on, you know, a lot of obviously female boxers get asked this, so I sort of apologize if it's something you keep getting asked. But what would your thoughts be in three minutes, right? Three minute rounds in women's boxing? To be honest, I, I wouldn't mind it. Like, if it's two minutes, I'm, I'm able for that. If it's three minutes, I'm able for that. Like, I'm training every single day, so it doesn't really matter to me if it's two or three. It just, if it's three minutes, everyone gets to see me a bit longer, so. 
and I, and I guess the, the the problem obviously is sometimes that women's boxing isn't as advanced as a as a men's sport. So if if you start having three minute rounds, the fights won't last, you know, because that two minute to three minute spell is probably where you'll do a lot more of your work, you know, and yeah, and there'll probably be a lot more danger involved. So probably for women's boxing mm-hmm. at the moment, the stabilizers sort of are on to make sure that there's no there's no health concerns for people and things like that. Yeah, like people are afraid to see females actually do something and that's the problem. Like they don't think that we're able for certain things when we are like we're just as good as any of them guys that are out there and we're well able to do anything as well. Just if they give us a chance to show everything, then we will show it and we'll prove everyone wrong as well. And and, and Katie's done it herself in the past. She's obviously sparred quite a lot of pros. Have you sparred any, any male pros yourself? Uh, I sparred a few, yeah, up in the Coliseum and stuff like that. And, like, it's great with pro boxing that people are there to help you and they're willing to help you as well. So, like, say if you're in a spar and, like, one of the guys will be, oh, yeah, you're dropping your right hand or you're, you need to keep your left up or throw this or throw that, which that's brilliant. And they're always willing to help and they're so respectful no matter what. And you just don't want them, obviously, if you are sparring, you just don't want them to go easy on you and think that because you're a girl, you're not going to be able to take a punch. See, if they try to go easy, all I have to do, just hit them back. And then they're like, shit, she's not going easy on me. So <laughs> I'll actually have to punch her. So I think I think they know at this stage, don't go easy on me, girls. I'll actually, I'll go hell for later. So. Or even try to punch you. Obviously, it's in landing the punch on you is probably going to be the thing as well. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, women's boxing, you know, it's, it's going from strength to strength. We don't obviously have, you know, you look obviously in the UK, you have Kitty Taylor, you know, Done it, done it all. Obviously, unified mm-hmm. at the full lightweight division. You've Chantel Cameron. You've obviously another. You Savannah Marshall. Um, I think there's four female world boxing champions in England at the moment as well. And and there's another fight yeah. obviously this weekend as well. Ebony Bridges and Shannon Courtney. Is it probably mm-hmm. fair now that women are getting the spotlight in the sport? We are. We're finally starting to get a spotlight that we deserve. And the uh, the thing is, there could be a lot more for us though. Like, you have guys fights nearly every single weekend, whereas it's only every now and again you'll see a female fight pop up, where there is a lot of us actually out there and a lot of us willing to fight. It's just giving us the opportunities we deserve and the publicity that we deserve for it. And and obviously a massive fight that's probably, you know, coming back from the Olympics and Katie and, and Natasha Jonas squaring off on May the 1st. Um, yeah. Obviously it'll be a grudge match from the Olympics, but obviously Katie should come through that with flying colours again. Yeah, no, that's that's a pretty exciting fight. I actually can't wait for that one myself. So, and and obviously one that's sort of got really, me really intrigued. A, a lot of eyes are obviously on this for for different reasons. But Shannon Courtney and Ebony Bridges this weekend. I was sort of watching the press conference earlier today, and Ebony Bridges is just, you know, she says all the right things. She's doing all the right things. Mm-hmm. Fans are probably sort of saying at times, well, why are they getting a world title fight at like five, six, seven fights in? But I think when Katie won her first world title, she was like seven or eight fights in. So yeah. people on one hand are giving female boxers respect, but at the same time, they're taking away and going, we well, don't deserve the fight. You only you only have it because you do this or you do that at weigh-ins. Yeah, like female boxing moves a lot quicker. And that is like, I, I think I've proved that myself, like three pro fights and I was fighting for three belts. Like it does move a lot quicker, but, like like I said, we do the work and we do deserve it. Like like the way to have five fights, they do deserve it. Like they're doing everything right. They're getting their name out there. They're working hard. It's not like they're getting in the ring and looking at each other. They're getting into the ring and they're going to fight and they're going to show everyone on the like when the fight that they're going to show and prove everyone wrong and show that they deserve it. Exactly, and I say as, as women boxing keeps growing, it's 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 <clears throat> bringing more eyes into the sport of obviously because sometimes a lot of Females, well, not obviously being sexist or anything in a way, but sometimes it's mostly a male-oriented sport. So if, if females are boxing, they're going to bring more females into the sport. Obviously, they make it more eyes in the sport as well, and potentially, obviously, more female boxers down the line as well. Yeah, like hopefully, I'm trying to do that myself and trying to show that we can do it. And if we set our mind to, no matter what it is, if it's boxing, if it's football, if it's painting, no matter what it is, if we set our mind to it, we can do it. Like. It's just, it's all to do with mindset and hopefully I can inspire at least one or two people like to do something like this and to achieve their goals. It is terrifying. Like doing what I'm doing is scary and not many people would admit that, but it is like, it's terrifying. And I'm excited though. Like 
I want to prove everyone that I can do it. I want to prove to myself that I can do it. Like there's a lot of people out there that are all talk and won't put anything behind it. Whereas I'm the opposite. I'm putting everything behind it and hopefully I'll inspire someone by it. Yep, definitely. And, and where would you, you know, obviously now become an icon for the sport and stuff as well. You know, it'd be great in a few years time if you're getting pictures from, or pictures or videos sent to you from Uyghurs obviously coming into the sport and stuff as well, saying that you're their idol. And, you know, that's, that's something I guess that you just keep going and doing your best. And obviously anything else comes out of it. Happy days. Yeah, like I've had one or two little girls on Instagram text me and tag me in their training videos. And when I comment back or text them back, they, they literally send videos of them crying. Like they can't believe that I'm doing it. And I'm just like, there's actually people out there that are interested in watching me. And like I am, I, I am a 20 year old girl and I do find that hard to believe. But then again, like my team remind me, like I am doing the hard work for it. So at least I am inspiring someone. Like I have one little girl in the boxing club in Kildare and she made me this lovely picture frame saying how I'm in her, like her idol and she's doing everything because I'm helping her out and stuff like that. And it makes you have a purpose and makes you feel like you're doing something right. And that's why I keep going as well. So. Exactly. And I say, it's, it, if, you, if you, can, you can get one set of eight, new eyes in the sport of somebody coming through, yeah. you've, you've done everything you can as, as well as obviously achieving your own dreams in the sport as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like I, a lot of people say, oh yeah, I want to grow up and go to the Olympics. Whereas I'm starting to get people send me videos saying, I want to grow up and be a professional boxer like Caitlin. I'm like, geez, you never, like you'd never hear that. Even when I was growing up, you'd never hear anyone say, I want to be a professional boxer. Whereas hearing that now, I'm like, that's actually, it's really inspiring even to me. So. It definitely is. And I say, it's, it's just, it just shapes well for the future. You know, men, men's sport yeah. in Ireland's obviously taking new levels. You know, you'd obviously Carl Frampton, um, who sadly obviously didn't become a three-weight world champion last week, but you know, mm. Katie's done everything in lightweight. You know, she's actually a two-weight world champion as well. So, you know, is the benchmark sort of there for you with Katie and, and going, whatever she sort of achieves, obviously the aim is to at least match it or, or do better? I know that I can match it and I know damn well that I can do even more. So it's just getting the opportunity to do it. And like I said, I am 20 years old and I do have a long path ahead of me. So it's just a matter of making each step as it comes. And whenever, whenever I get the opportunity to take the big steps, I'm ready to do it and I have the right team behind me to do it. Fantastic. And I say it's, it's, it's refreshing sometimes when you see that people have dreams and aspirations. Every, every sort of boxer turns pro obviously has the ambitions of becoming a world champion. But, you know, you can hear about obviously what you say that it's, it's well ingrained in your head of, of what you want to do in the sport. What would your sort of plans be next 12 to 24 months and, and where your boxing career should be aimed to sort of be in the next two years? I'd like to get a lot more fights under my belt. I know it's hard with COVID and things and that going on, but I'd like to get another few this year at least. And the more fights I have, the more eyes that will be on me and hopefully I get a good a good opportunity this time with a big name. So. Fantastic. And is there any sort of word on when, when you should be out next? I know Leonard's been sort of teasing, um, obviously show up without saying too much sort of, but I know Leonard's been teasing about possibly another way day. Um, have you sort of... Any, any idea of when you may be out next? Yeah, so we don't actually have any dates or anything yet, but there has been talks about some fights going on away again. So it's just whenever it happens, I'm ready for it. So Fantastic. And look, sort of before we let you go, we'll sort of give you give you an opportunity. Obviously, thank a lot of them sponsors that's out there. It's, it's obviously helping you to continue to keep doing what you do. Yeah, no, I guess massive, massive thank you to all my sponsors that stick on board and help me through camp and through fights. And if it really wasn't for the sponsors, fighters like me wouldn't be where we are today. And to everyone else that is supporting me, like through even just liking or sharing a post, that's getting my name out there. And that's showing my sponsors that their name is out there too. So thank you to everyone. So Fantastic. Yeah, well, well, listen, it's always been a pleasure, for, obviously, finally get, get you on. You're, you're actually our 50th interview since we started. So sort of hey. we're, we're reaching a milestone together as well. So Exactly, um, yeah. Well, obviously, keep... Keep obviously watchful eyes and obviously your career moving forward and hopefully we can get another catch up again soon. Yeah, no, definitely. I really appreciate it and thank you for your time. So not a problem, Kevin. Cheers, thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.